Let's stand and grab a hymnal, and we'll start off with a special request. Does anybody have a request? Elijah. 494. 494. Blue book. 494.
time and I didn't see who was first. What was Jeff? Lily of the Valley. Perfect. 447? All right, 447. Lily of the Valley. I had a coworker that used to sing this song at the worst times of the day. It would be a really awful day at work and you just start singing this and be like, yeah, you're right, but man. <laughs> so let's sing it and it's a good time to sing it. So let's sing it and enjoy it while we're singing it. and then we'll all come in. So making his the that I owed, freedom true he has bestowed. Let's just have the ladies sing that and then all the guys will come back in on So I'm Singing on the Road. Second verse, ready? Jesus made it all. 
saying anything. Have a seat. All right. Good evening, everybody. Does anybody need to hear the announcements again? Main announcements are Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving. So, one o'clock. You are welcome to come here at 1 o'clock. If you are going to make it, please let Beth know. Uh, you do not have to bring anything. If you'd like to bring a side, I think there's all the main dishes. We have <coughs> geese and turkeys and swans. <laughs> so, <clears throat> ducks? We got any ducks? No ducks. Just geese, turkey, and swans. Uh, who? Which of the kids asked the question, why doesn't Jesus say please? Who's that? <coughs> You asked. Okay. All right. So you'll be in here for the answer. Okay. So we got a, we got a, oh, I'm all over it. Yeah. So we got a, a list back there on the fridge if you want to sign up. Uh, okay. So we also have a game planned for Thanksgiving. And uh, there's this thing about oldest children that aren't very creative. <coughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's me, the oldest child. Okay. <laughs> yep. And then there's this thing about the younger children who are like super creative and disconnected from reality sometimes. <laughs> okay. And, and middle children are middle children, but there's there's degrees to that depending on lots of psychological things I don't understand. So in our home, we have uh, the creative side. And then we have the, uh, the intellectual, logical side. So, so Beth was trying to come up with a game for Thanksgiving and, and uh, couldn't find anything that she really liked. She's like, I'll just make up my own. So she comes upstairs after a couple hours. She's like, what do you think of this game? And so here's, here's the game. There's this riddle. So there's going to be two teams split up into two teams. And then the first team that goes first, let's say team one, they get this riddle. And what you have to do is solve the riddle. That's the first part. So here's the riddle. Um, I am made with these ingredients, blank, oil, flour, and water. Uh, blank, oil, messed it up already. It's okay. It won't matter. Blank, uh, blank, oil, salt, and water. If you add blank, it will cause me to rise. I am what? Bread, okay, if you add what, it'll cause me to rise. Yeast. Yeast, okay, and then the first one was supposed to be, I messed it up, flour, okay, so flour. Except all of the words have to be a Bible word. So they have to be a word found in the Bible. So you can't say yeast, you gotta say leaven. Okay, so now you've solved the riddle, now the game begins. Since there's three words, you get three minutes, and your team is gonna have a selected scribe and the scribe is going to be the one that writes on the paper, but your team has to figure out the book, the chapter, and the verse without a Bible for each of your three answers. Okay? So no phones allowed, no Bibles allowed, and you, and you have to... <laughs> and, you, and you have to come up with a book, chapter, verse. If you get the book right, let's say you said flower, and you picked... Uh, Leviticus, right? You're like, I know it's in there somewhere. Then you get five points, right? If you guessed a chapter and you got the chapter right, then you get an additional 10 points. And if you got the verse right, you get an additional 20 points, okay? And if you don't like flour, you could use meal or grain or wheat or any other Bible word that fits the riddle. And Beth is the one that determines whether it fits the riddle or not, right? So <coughs> no arguing. She's the the game maker. So if you don't get the book, chapter, and verse right, okay, so if you get, you get your points, you get scored, you get graded, then if you don't get some of those right, the other team has three minutes to come up with their own uh, answers that you couldn't answer. So if you got Leviticus right but book and chapter wrong, then they get to guess again, all right? And then you go through and get your points that way. Then, so that'll be three, and then the next round will be team two, and they'll have a riddle with three, and then team one will get a chance to answer theirs that they missed. All right? So that's the game, yes. So all the riddles coming out of one book? 
Beth made up all the riddles. They're all Thanksgiving themed. Oh, you're trying to get ahead, aren't you? <laughs> so they're all, they're all Thanksgiving themed. So if you want to know where every kind of Thanksgiving word possible ever is in the Bible, have a few ready. There you go. I don't know any. That's the only, that's the only riddle I know. So, uh, so that was the one that we used for a, a test. All right, and then after that, I think we have a movie picked out. So we're going to set up, uh, do we have any other games, maybe? Okay, so bring board games for afterwards. We have a, a movie that I hadn't seen in 20 years, and the kids got it for Christmas last year or something, and we, they were watching it the other day, and uh, it, was, it was a really good um, video. So I think we'll play that after, after the games. If anybody wants to stick around, we'll set up the the screen and the projector and the sound system and all that, okay? Bring, Bring your comfy <laughs> chairs. Okay, our first question is in John chapter 4. Why doesn't Jesus say please when he asks for a drink of water? All right, John chapter 4. And we'll pray and get this answer figured out. Lord, I thank you for, uh, thank you for today. God, thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for good friends and family and Lord, I ask that you please uh, bless this evening, uh, Lord, as we look in your word, a couple things uh, that might be a help and might answer some, some lingering questions or phrases that people have heard me say and didn't understand, or uh, clarification on last week's sermon, Lord, I ask that you please uh, help this uh, lesson this afternoon, question answers, to be pleasing to you and helpful and edifying, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, John 4 <coughs> is the story of the woman at the well. So we're going to try to get through three questions here. We'll go a little quickly, so you listen quickly and I'll go quickly. John chapter 4, verse 5, Then he cometh, cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. What's the sixth hour? Does anybody remember? Sixth hour of daylight would be... Who said noon? Noon. So in the Bible, usually when you see the hour, it's talking about the hour of daylight. So you can just start from 6 a.m. and get a rough idea. It's about noon, high noon. So it's hot. Jesus is weary. Then, uh, verse 7, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And uh, from what I've understood about history and the culture, uh, that's an odd time for her to be there. Most people would do this in the morning and have your water for the day. Then you do it in the evening and have water for the morning the next day. So she's there in the middle of the day for some reason. We know the reason is because she has five husbands and she can't figure out which one she loves. So verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Doesn't that sound kind of rude? <laughs> so the question is, why doesn't Jesus say please? I remember being in sixth grade and somebody asked a similar question. One of the students in class said, I heard my preacher preaching last Sunday, and he was talking to God, and he said, you can talk to God anywhere. And he said he was walking down the sidewalk, and he said, God, I need you to give me $100 so that I can pay my bills, whatever it was, something like that. I need you to give me this thing. Lord, give me $100 so I can pay my bills. And the sixth grader in my class asked the sixth grade teacher, why didn't he say please? He just told God what to do and didn't even say please. <laughs> Turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And verse 29. John 8, 29, and he that sent me, that's God sending Jesus Christ, he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that what? That please him. When you say, please, can I have a drink of water, or please, can I get down from dinner, or please, you are saying please to show that you're being polite. Please means that you're saying something to somebody else out of consideration. So, can you be polite without saying please? Absolutely. So, Jesus is speaking to this woman, and he says, give me a drink of water. And whether he said please or not, I don't know. It doesn't say that he said that. 
but was Jesus being polite? Jesus was speaking to that woman directly, and he said, give me a drink of water, and then he's off with a message. So the answer to the question is, you can be polite without saying please. But if your parents tell you to say please, then you don't have much choice. All right. <laughs> All right, 1 Timothy 5, 1 Timothy 5. The please is to teach you how to be polite. And you can be polite in other ways. 1 Timothy 5, here's a good question. This um, is tied into last week's sermon. Is it okay or biblical to rebuke your parents if they are in sin? So last Sunday we, I preached on uh, the verse in the Old Testament that says rebuke thy neighbor. When is it right to give a rebuke? Um, that message was probably like one third of what I wanted to say about everything and I still went way long. <coughs> there are so many things on reproving and rebuking and exhorting in the Bible that it would be a, quite an in-depth study to get all the details but uh, maybe this will answer some, some specific question here. Is it, the final question, is it okay for a child to rebuke? All right, so First Timothy 5 has a pretty good answer to your question, and we'll talk about this in detail here for just a minute. First Timothy 5, and verse 1, it says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as what? As a father. And the younger men, so it's implied here that you're entreating the younger men also as what? As brethren. There's the family of God again in the church in the body of believers. Now you say, is that elder a position in the church or is that man somebody who's older than you? Look at verse 2. This is the great question and we'll try to answer it. When it says elder, sometimes you don't know if it's just an older guy or if it's a person that has a position. Verse 2, the elder women as what? as mothers, and then the same thing, okay, and younger as sisters with all purity. So this is talking about ages, and when it says an elder person is uh, an elder like a father and treat him as a father, it doesn't mean I was born in January and you were born in December, so you're my elder, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean that. People, I hear that all the time, but uh, people, <clears throat> people are, uh, Paul is talking here to Timothy, and he says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. So an elder is someone that is your senior by a good number of years, right? Enough to be your father, let's say. So, so this elder is a senior, and he's a reference to age. Now, can it be connected to something spiritual? Same chapter, look at verse 17. 17. What about this elder that uh, has a, a rule? Look in First Timothy 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So there's a different type of honor for somebody who's not just old and not just gray-headed and not just a, uh, a judge in a courtroom. That deserves a, a level of honor. But there's somebody who has, should have double honor, and that's somebody, verse 17, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now we're getting into men in the church who've been faithful in the church and who have studied the Bible. And what are you supposed to do with this person? Look at verse 19. If there's a problem, what do you do? Verse 19, against an elder receive not an accusation. So we're still in the same chapter. Context is, uh, Timothy, when you have to deal with problems in the church, men that are older than you, if you hear about somebody who's older than you, an elder, you say, now is this one somebody that is a position in the church or just age? I don't know. Probably both. Anybody who's in that position of age, older than you. Anybody who's in that position in the church. Or how about this, a parent? Because it said and treat elders as a father. So parents kind of automatically get that position. Now what if somebody accuses them of something? What if there's an accusation against an elder? Do not receive the accusation but... Here's the exception. Before two or three witnesses. You say, why does the Bible always say two or three witnesses? Does that bother anybody else? Why does it say three? Just, we need three. We get it that it's not one, but why does it say two or three? Suppose you heard something about somebody, and you heard two people at the same time brought you the same story and said, we saw such and such happen. Now you have two witnesses. Do you take those two witnesses and go rebuke the guy? What if those two people are in collusion? Right? Yeah. 
Now, what if those two people aren't known to be trustworthy, or one of them isn't, and the other one's a follower? What if you have some wisdom and discernment because you read Proverbs a couple times, and you can say, I'm going to go with the three on this one and not the two. And then you do hear it from a third person, and you say, okay, I believe those two people together are not in collusion, that they, are, they saw something wrong, and I have a third witness. And now this thing is known, and it needs to be addressed. What do you do when it needs to be addressed, whether it's an elder or whether it's anybody? Look at verse 20. Look at verse 20. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may fear. What are you supposed to do? Uh, how about number one, be careful when you hear something bad about somebody older than you. Okay? Just be careful. And here's what my wife and I do. We'll keep the thing to ourselves. Sometimes women have this creep alarm. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> and if the womanly creep alarm goes off and I get notified, I get a little notification uh, during the day <clears throat> about this alarm, then I say, okay. And we keep that to ourselves. And I don't stand and tell somebody else and pass it along and ask so-and-so what they think. I say, hey, I'm between us two. We're just going to not let our kids go there, right? Between us two, we're just not going to trust that person with such and such, right? And if that happens, then we uh, keep that between ourselves. And then if it becomes a public thing, then the Bible says, them that sin, rebuke before all. Now, the question is specifically, parents, turn to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. We were going to go to a meeting one time across the uh, country, across the state actually, in the state. We heard that so-and-so brother XYZ was going to be there. We had heard such and such about brother XYZ and we said, oh man, should we just not go to the meeting? We already wanted to go. We were kind of looking forward to it. But this guy's going to be there, and we'd heard something about him that uh, was the mouth of one witness. And we said, well, I think we still should go to the meeting. If this brother is there, then we're just going to keep an eye on our kids. Right? He said, I thought all church people were good. No, you're called a soft target. <laughs> so keep your gun on your hip. I mean, not literally, but some of you literally. <laughs> Let me know if you are, and I do mean that literally. Okay, and then uh, if somebody comes in the door and starts screaming and yelling and cussing, tackle him. Everybody just bum rush him and tackle him, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that better than two, three, four, five people dying? One guy bum rush him, everybody follows suit, and then we'll take care of it and figure out what we need to do after that. <clears throat> I'm serious as a heart attack. All right, so what do you do when you, when, when you have a situation like that? Well, how about this? How about before you go to the meeting that you pray? You thought I lost track of where I was, but I didn't. How about you pray before you go to the meeting and say, Lord, would you please help us have a good time at this meeting and protect the kids and blah, blah, blah. Guess what? The guy didn't end up making it to the meeting. No big deal, right? Still have never met the guy. And uh, you say, well, I don't like that, that there's bad people in church. There's bad people everywhere, and if the church is a hospital for people to get better, right, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to be around people that may hurt you. So why don't you do what Jesus did and allow yourself to be in a position where you may get wounded in the house of your friends and then be useful to the Lord and trust the Lord with that. Now, how do you rebuke somebody? <clears throat> what if it's your parents? You have to deal with this. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. It is commonly is reported commonly there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. This church knew about the problem because it says it is reported what? Commonly. It's called common knowledge. What did this church do about it? Did they say, oh, we should, we should talk to him. Oh, this isn't good. No, it tells you what they did in verse 2. Ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned. So this is the Corinthian church turning into the liberal apostate church of its day, allowing and accepting everything because anything goes at our church because Jesus loves everybody. God is still speaking rainbow comma. Okay? Oh, he is. Just not to you. You're listening to a devil. And you're puffed up 
and you have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now it goes on to describe this particular situation, but he gives a list in verse 11. Verse 11, But I have written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a what? A brother. It doesn't say you can't talk to anybody in the world and you have to isolate yourself and ride in a covered wagon with a triangle on the back. It doesn't say that. It says, if this guy claims to be saved and you know him as a brother, but he has these attributes in his life that are commonly reported. I didn't say he sinned one time in the past. I said he's commonly known as a, here's the list, fornicator, covetous, covetous to the point of it controlling his life and emotions. And I've met this person uh, 160 miles from here, just, just uh, completely consumed with money. And he's called a brother. Uh, or an idolater, or a railer. There's somebody that loses their temper and utters abusive language. That's a railer. This is commonly known. I didn't say the guy lost his temper and wrapped his golf club around a tree once in his life. He's a railer and he's known for it. Or a drunkard, known for it, continual. Or an extortioner. An extortioner, where's my definition for that? Obtained by compulsive misuse of authority by using fear and threat. You thought extortion was money. Extortion is compulsively manipulating other people and abusing your authority. Extortioner. Okay? So if you have those people in your company, you are supposed to not keep company with them with such an one know not to eat. You say, what if it's my very parents? Um, well, how about this? Do you have to address it? <clears throat> You have to call them and say, you are this. Because I have had to do this to uh, this brother and this brother and this brother. And none of those brethren, I wrote them a letter and called them and said, Brother, according to 1 Corinthians 5, I am not keeping company with you anymore. Signed and notarized by the bank downtown. I didn't do that. I said, Lord, I can't keep company with this guy. This guy is like mentally unstable because this has consumed his life. One of these brothers was kicked out of a church after we left the church to move to Montana. One of them was family. One of them was just a guy I worked for in Hardin. And uh, in, in dealing with these people, I did not go hunt them down or call them up or give them 15 reasons why I wasn't keeping company with them. I just stopped inviting them to my house and stopped working for them or whatever the situation was. Now what if you do have to address it? Matthew 18. Turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 15. Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, that's anybody, any age, go and tell him his fault between thee and him, what? Alone. Alone. All right? So talk to him. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. That means that you lost him as a brother, right? And if you don't talk to him, you're not going to get him back as a brother. A brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city. So if you've lost contact with him and you need to gain con contact and fellowship, talk to him and tell him, this is a sin that you have done. You say, what if it's somebody that's older than you? I would suggest taking somebody with you. What if you had to rebuke somebody that's 40 years your senior? Or what if you had a parent that did something that was absolutely wicked and sinful and you don't have two or three witnesses? but you had something wrong done to you, I would take somebody with you. You know who I would take with you if it was something illegal? I would call the police. Amen. So don't come to me as a pastor and say, such and such happened to me and this was illegal. Call the police. You can call 911 any time of day and they'll say, is this administrative or is this an emergency, right? And they'll get you to the right place. Or you can look up in the on the internet or whatever and find the sheriff's office or the police office, the regular number. So 
uh, skip all those steps and go straight to the police if somebody did something unlawful. And don't go to the police and then back out of your story and say, well, it wasn't really that bad. Well, I don't really remember what happened. If something happened, write it down and report it to the police. Well, I'm the only one. Well, I'm going to hurt them. I'm going to make their life miserable. Report it to the police. Okay. First of all, let's say it's not that serious of a sin. If somebody trespasses against you, then go to him alone. Number two, verse 16, if he will not hear thee alone, then take with thee one or two more. Since one or two plus one equals two or three, now we have the two or three witnesses that every word may be established. Every time I go to address somebody with a problem, not every time, I've had this happen four or five times in my life. I'll go to address somebody with a problem, and they'll say, how come you brought these people with you and didn't come to me alone? Or I'll go to them alone, and they'll say, how come you didn't bring two or three with you? And no matter what you do, they'll accuse you of not doing what you're supposed to do. Why? Because they're in the wrong, and because they're guilty, and their conscience is convicting them. If they have any conscience left, they're just <laughs> flailing. All right? So take two or three with you. You say, well, i got to tell somebody else. Then bring somebody older that you trust that's not a blabbermouth. How about that? Right? Such simple things. <clears throat> All right, verse 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them, you and the two or three, tell it, or the one or two, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. How many of you have been in the church in the most awkward situation ever, like more awkward than the situations I can come up with, where somebody is confessing their sin to everybody before the whole church? How many of you have been in one of those weird down south deals <laughs> or Ohio deals or California deals? Yeah. Uh, they skipped a couple steps. If you sinned against an individual, go confess your sin to God. David says, against thee and thee only have I sinned, and in this wickedness in thy sight, and go confess your sin to the individual that you wronged. If you thought it in your mind and never said it to the individual, go, don't, don't go tell the individual what you thought. <laughs> confess it to God and leave it there, and it's done. If you sin publicly in a church before 40 or 50 people, and you quote an ESV and don't even realize you're quoting it, apologize publicly. It was a public offense, so apologize publicly. I don't know who would ever do that <laughs> on a Wednesday night church service. Confess your sins to God and confess your sins or, or seek forgiveness for your sins from the individual that you wronged if it affected them, if they are aware of it, know about it, and if it affected them. All right. Uh, if they skip all those steps then tell it unto the church. If he neglect to hear the church, now we come to a legal matter. Let him be unto thee as a what? A heathen man and a publican. How many of you have heard that you shouldn't take a saved person to court? All right. Let's say you went to that person and you went with yourself and you said, brother, you did this wrong. You took two or three. Brother, you did this wrong and he won't hear you. Brother, we're bringing this before the church. That doesn't necessarily mean the congregation. It could be the leaders of the church. It could be the whole congregation. You bring it before the church, and he still won't hear it. What do you do? You consider him to be a lost man, even though he might be saved. You say, I don't believe in taking a saved man to church. Right there, you consider him a lost man, and you are allowed to take him legally to court. You say, I don't have a clear conscience about that. You study and pray about that verse. I didn't either the first time somebody showed that to me. But you consider him a heathen and a publican, and then you take your million-dollar court case to court where it belongs. And that's the proper way to handle a brother who has trespassed against you. Um, last thing, last note on this. In 1 Timothy 5, <clears throat> where it says, Them that sin rebuke before all. These are instructions in 1 Timothy for a preacher preaching to people in the church, right? So the guy that's rebuking before everybody is a preacher in that position, and I don't think that applies to parents. But don't do this. Don't rebuke a parent and then have to call that parent later and say, you know that verse in 1 Timothy 5.1 that says, uh, rebuke not an elder but and treat him as a father? I'm sorry for rebuking you as <laughs> being a father. And uh, the elder is compared to the father, like the father is even closer. And obviously, you wouldn't rebuke a parent, right? Don't make that mistake. 
all right? So do you have to confront the sin? Bring somebody older with you. That's the short answer. And if you don't have to confront it and you can avoid them and not keep company with them, pray about that and consider that. Okay, uh, last question. Any, any other questions on that? This question always keeps everybody's attention ever since Bible school and the preacher discussing it in our Bible classes all the way up till today. Yes? Rebuke them in open church? Not first. Not at first. No. But if it's an open sin and it openly affects the church, we were talking about rebukes last Sunday morning and different kinds of rebukes. And I was saying the best way to take a rebuke is in church verbally, right? So if you're in the preaching and you hear a rebuke, right, and the preacher's really, I mean, he's just just lobbing every missile right at you, nobody probably knows. The preacher doesn't even know half the time what he's saying to affect people. And if you can take the rebuke that way, them that sin rebuke before all, right? And take your rebuke there, get it right with the Lord, nobody is the wiser, and then you, got, and you both go on, right? And the preacher's like, God, please use me. And the people in the congregation are like, God, quit using him. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so then that sin rebuke before all. But if it's a public thing and somebody does public damage to a church, then sure, elder or not. Because that's that. That could split the church. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely seen that. <laughs> yes. So what if they're not in church, but they are saved? Then they're in, then they are in the church. They are in the body of Christ church even though they're not attending church. Yep. Yep. So consider them as a brother, and all these things are for dealing with Christians. Yep. If they're a lost man, then, again, if they did something illegal, go to the authorities. But if it's a lost man, you, you need to get them saved. Like, you can't rebuke a Muslim and be like, you need to follow the New Testament. <laughs> no, you need to get saved, and then we need to follow the New Testament. So, yes? So if you go to someone and rebuke them, and they say, you are wrong in your rebuke. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is not true. Mm -hmm. It's false. You go, no, it's I'm pretty sure it's right. Mm -hmm. I know it's right. And so you go t and to someone else, and then the two of you go to this guy, and he goes, no, it's you're still wrong. Yep. What you're saying is not true. Right. And then you take it to the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a trial? It can to, be. To, to, to see which side is correct? I've been to those too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. So that everything can be established as to what happened yeah, or didn't happen. Mm -hmm. we, I showed up to class one night in Bible school and there was a uh, class was supposed to be upstairs. It was a two story building. So I walked into the downstairs where the stairwell was and I couldn't get to the stairs. All the seats were full for the downstairs class. The whole back of the room was full of standing people, and there was a police officer in the back of the room. And my preacher was the teacher for that hour. He was supposed to be upstairs, but he was downstairs. And I said, what is going on here? And I had gotten there just at the very, very beginning of a church disciplining process. So there was a, a kid in school, and he had threatened another student in school I uh, threatened him verbally, and then he threatened him with a knife, and then he said that he had a gun. So he was called up. Did you do these things? Yes. Did you say those things? Yes, I did. Why did you do those things? Whatever. He had his time to speak. And the brother that he had threatened, he was, he was a guy that was like a brick shy of a load kind of a guy, you know, like, <laughs> like taking school and doing fine, but just one crayon missing or something. So... Um, Good, good kid, but I'm just trying to tell you who he was. I mean, he was, yeah. he was that kind of kid. So he called him up, Brother So-and-so, you come up, stand here. Did he threaten you? Did he say these things? Yes, he did. Yes, he, he said this. Did he point a gun at you? No. Did he threaten you with a gun? Yes. He said he has one in his room. Do you have one in your room? Yes. And it went back and forth like that for a minute. Nothing got out of control. It was, uh, this has been addressed before, and this has been addressed uh in private, one, like obviously one-on-one -on -one had already happened with a knife and a gun involved. And then uh, some other brothers got involved and they said, what are we going to do here? Well, this kid had been a problem and nobody knew that in another part of the country or another part of the world. He was in a different country and he had been a problem in his previous church in another country in the world. So he had come from Korea and then he was in Canada and then he was in the United States going to school where we were. And he knew other churches that were affiliated with our church in these places. He had been a problem in all of those churches. I, I didn't know any of this about him. 
all I knew was he was rude and inconsiderate, and he had said some really unkind things to people, and I, I just steered clear of him. So they said, here's what we're going to do. Brother so-and-so with the knife and the gun, you're going to walk with Officer so-and-so. He's a guy in the church. You're going to walk with him over to your place. You're going to turn over your gun and your uh, things to him. He's going to let you clean out your stuff, and, and you're gone. And you're no longer welcome at this school. You're no longer welcome at this church. You're done. All right, class will begin in five minutes. <laughs> And that was church discipline that took place where it had to be brought before the church. And the church was the student body that evening. All right. So, so if you're talking about a doctrinal disagreement, I don't think that's the case here. I think this is a brother trespass against thee. However, if the doctrinal disagreement is affecting the church and the church has established this is what we believe and somebody else says this is what we believe instead and we're disagreeing, that is how churches split. Yeah. And uh, I don't think it needs to be that complicated. How about you just agree with the Lord? And how about if there's a doctrinal difference, you just say, Hey, preacher, I disagree with you on this thing, and uh, I'm going to keep it to myself. And when you preach against it, I'm going to disagree with you, but I want you to know where we stand. I've had a Pentecostal in my church, and we had that discussion, and we got along fine. I said, Brother, I'm against tongues. I'm going to preach against tongues, and I'm not going to, one second, and I'm not going to hold it over your head. And I know that you have other people that you know and love or family members that talk in tongues. And I, I've told you I'm against that. We've gone through the book of Acts and shown you why and what for. And if you're okay with learning from me, I'm okay with you being here. But do not teach tongues and dreams and visions in the church, and you're welcome to be here. And any other doctrine, that's, that's just a common thing. What do you expect? I mean, do you expect every single person to agree with you on every single detail of every Bible doctrine? You're, you're nuts. You're just, you're not living in reality. You're, you're crazy. All right? So I certainly, you, you know, everybody here knows, I go off on tangents and say some goofy things and read Babylon B from the pulpit. I mean, I don't even know if I'm supposed to do that. But you don't have to agree with every single thing I say. And if you can overlook my flaws and I can overlook your flaws, then we can be brethren in the same body. And, and sometimes we get dirt on our fingers. Yes. Just for clarification, this is a brother having having actually trespassed against you, not them living in a way or doing something that you disagree with. Yeah, they're slightly different. So. Yep. 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 This guy's it's a personal thing. Would you have? Okay. All right. Uh, I think we have time for one more. So if they're doing something in the community that would reflect on the church body, then you should. Address it alone, because that is a trespass against. So that means a trespass is a sin. You crossed a line. I do realize that Matthew 18 is Old Testament context, so trespass the law, right? So I'm taking that and applying it to the New Testament. They have sinned, and they have done something unscriptural, unbiblical, and, yeah, it's affecting their testimony and the church's testimony. Yep, so they <coughs> should be addressed individually. And And it doesn't have to be... Did you hear what so and so? When are you going to talk to them? When are you going to talk to them? It doesn't have to be like that. It can be done with prayer. It can be done with grace. It can be done with time. The Lord says He gave Jezebel space to repent in Revelation, and and you give somebody time to make their bed, so to speak, right? And sometimes people make a big enough mess of it they figure it out themselves. And that story with the uh, with the two kids and, uh, threatening each other, or one threatening the other one. Uh, that story was a real unique thing. I know it's unique anywhere, but our preacher <coughs> would let things go in the school and in the church, problems. He would let them go until other people in the church were like, you're letting this go way too far. And he would give it time and prayer and give that person time to, to sometimes to figure it out themselves or embarrass themselves so bad they don't come back on their own. And the problem will sometimes deal with itself. And other preachers say, no, no, you should deal with things quickly and the sooner the better. And I prefer the sooner the better but with prayer and with the Lord's leading, right? You can get through a lot of problems. Yes? Why was the, the boy with the gun angry with the disabled? He was, he was a little mentally unstable. I had a friend in class who had a mole on his cheek, and he, uh, so this Korean kid came up to us while we were studying our note cards before class, mm -hmm. and the Korean kid said, I had a dream last night. He said, okay. He said, I had a dream last night that you were, you were in my dream. This is weird, but okay. And he says, I, there, was, there was a cockroach crawling on your face. And then in my dream, I realized it wasn't a cockroach. It was the mole on your face. 
And I was like, this guy's not all there. <laughs> so was he schizophrenic? Maybe, maybe something. Yeah, he was mentally unstable. And the other kid had a good heart. So it was these two kids that had... There's always more than one problem, right? It never, <laughs> it's never so simple. It's, it's always compounded things. So... Yes, yes. Okay, so what if they are sinning against you, but they don't go to church, but they're in the wrong in some, on so many levels, what do you do? Can you tell them they're wrong and still fellowship with them? Then you need to tell them you're wrong. You need to say, you are wrong, and this is why I cannot fellowship with you. Yep, yep, yep. All right, that was an exciting one. <laughs> I think we're done. I got one more, but this was going to be more than 10 minutes. So, next week, why do people go to the altar for prayer? All right, why do you go to the altar? We'll cover that one next week. Lord, I ask that you would please uh, help us to remember that your word has the answers, and I probably didn't give every last answer tonight. If somebody has a specific problem, Lord, I ask that you please help them to find the answers of Scripture. If you're willing to study and seek and uh, draw close to you to do what's right. And uh, Lord, another old preacher said, uh, if our heart's right, you'll straighten out all the kinks in our head. And Lord, I ask you, please help us to have a right heart and trust you to lead us, guide us, and trust you to take care of the situations as they come up. And uh, and uh, ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. <laughs> all right. Have a good week. Paul. I think your third friend just had a question that maybe didn't get answered. This one here? She was just telling me Joey had a question. Yeah, yeah, I caught her too. <laughs> Maybe I need rebuked. <laughs> Rachel, make up a question. <laughs>